Hey everyone, and welcome to After Dark Analysis. Today I am going to be working with the movie Void to talk about a small subsect in horror that he's noticed, and today we're going to try and analyze and define it. What I've noticed over the years while I was growing up, these are the type of movies that always fascinated me because the thing is, I always loved horror, but I also loved like glitzy, pink, girly shit. And um, somehow I grew up with this genre, subgenre, if you want to call it that. This all started with Heathers back in 1986. Heathers absolutely set the trend here, both in the aesthetics and in the writing. When we look at Winona Ryder and her boyfriend in the film, there is a much darker sense of dress and there's a much darker sense of humor. When we look at the rest of the Heathers, they're all dressed in bright pinks and pastels. And they do that lighter kind of comedy, a lot of times coming from kind of how ditzy and airheaded they are. And while they sit in opposition to each other, that is really what defines and forms this subgenre. It's a sort of thought. Like the thing is, serial killers, killers in general, don't always have to be dark or grim or gruesome. Your serial killer can be pink and glitter, being the trendiest little thing on Twitter, and be murdering away like there's no tomorrow. That's pretty much what this subgenre created. It's like this the sweet, innocent, feminine little wet dream of every boy on the planet committing these totally cruel acts. With Heathers, we had that kind of male and female partnership, and it didn't really feel like one was leading the other. It seemed like they were influencing each other to do what they wanted to do anyway. But as we move on in this genre, because next up we have Buffy the Vampire Slayer, the film, she did have a male trainer, but as he trained her more and more and more, it made sense for him to go back into the shadows and more into the background, because eventually he's going to have to stop training her. And the more skilled she gets and the more she goes out and handles things on her own, the better she's going to learn. And we're going to kind of see this through the genre. We see the male presence dip off a lot more. So we have female protagonists and antagonists, and sometimes it's a group, sometimes they're solo, but it becomes very female-centric. The thing with Buffy is, um, it already, like, it didn't really give room for the male character at all. When uh, the Buffy movie came out, the central point was, like, this girl is the chosen one. This is the girl who is going to like defend the world from certain doom, from all sorts of vampires and creatures and all sorts of stuff. I know a lot of people don't enjoy the original Buffy movie as much as the TV show, but the Buffy movie it generally made the final girl of the horror films be the main protagonist of these movies. It gave some sort of like, um, the girl was usually just the side figure in these films, the main character. And I think that like made this big difference. And that's part of what sets this off a little bit more than just the aesthetics. Is in traditional horror, Texas Chainsaw is a good example, we have a girl that does survive to the end. Sally totally makes it, but she started out in a group comprised of both males and females. So that group did try and protect each other and they did try and save each other. But typically these type of films, either the woman's completely by herself or she has very little help. Or if we're dealing with a group situation, it's an all female group. And that's where we see a deviation with gender roles because that is a very big core component of this genre. And almost all of them seem to have that particular plot line. That is correct. The thing is, in the Texas Chainsaws, the girl had to, like, develop. She had to mm -hmm. realize she was the final girl. She had to realize that if she didn't defend her group or defend herself, that the killers were going to win. And here we have the girl being the central thing. It starts and ends with the girl. She doesn't have to go through a character arc because she pretty much is the thing that saves the day. Even though in Buffy, Buffy is a good example. Buffy is pretty much a big character arc. In the original Buffy movie, Buffy starts out as this really airheaded cheerleader type of girl. 
by noticing that she is the chosen one and by noticing that she is the one who is supposed to pretty much save the entire world from all these vampires, um, she gains responsibility, she becomes more adult, she pretty much goes through this character arc where she becomes a hero. She starts off as any regular teenage girl and pretty much becomes the one who saves the day. And even in that kind of silly, lighthearted, Buffy's an airhead humor in the movie, there's still this kind of deep-rooted commentary. Because the first time she meets her trainer at cheerleading practice, he says, you're the chosen one, you have the mark, and kind of moves her sweater to the side. And he asks where the mole is, and she says, oh, that ugly thing, I had it removed. So Vanity is what kind of took that mark from her, even when she was kind of silly and dumb and didn't want to be taken seriously. She had this fate and this honor-bound thing that she was apparently born into. And in a way, she tried to escape that via purely cosmetic means. I just always remember that line that uh, she doesn't want to even take him seriously. The thing she says to him when they're having their first serious conversation is, do you see spots? Does Elvis talk to you? She like pretty much sees him as he's like completely insane. Absolutely. That sense of sarcasm creating the humor, from my understanding, transitioned into the show as well. But it's what creates the humor and that does seem to run a lot through this genre. And where some of the darker comedic elements come from is that very weird sense of sarcasm they all seem to carry. The thing is, like, in the show, you already had her as this responsible character. You don't really see a lot of airhead Buffy in the show. The movie already, like, showed the world that Buffy was this airhead and became a hero. The, the show pretty much had the advantage that she, they didn't have to, like, develop Buffy. From episode one, already in the first season, Buffy was a hero here. This is where we get to another show that pretty much was almost like an imitation of Buffy at first, but became its own thing called Charmed. Like a year right after Buffy. At first it like really seemed like they were just trying to cash in on Buffy, but they used what Buffy didn't have in the show, but did have in the movie. The show was about three women who were trying to lead a normal life and trying to deal with the regular obstacles anyone has in the world and sort of became these witches who protected the world from demons and so on. The thing is, what Charm did was it took the character arc the Buffy show had and the Buffy movie had and put it into their own show. And that's pretty much where... I mean, even though Charmed wasn't as big as Buffy, they pretty much did what Buffy did with a movie and a TV show, just in a TV show. And before somebody calls us out in the comments, I'm well aware that Wheaton has completely disowned the Buffy movie. There were some changes and some editing decisions he was not happy with. But what we're talking about here is more of the story structure and the arcs that took place as a precursor and a prequel, if you will, to the show. We're not just doing Joseph Campbell's The Hero's Journey, because we see that all throughout literature and movies, but this seems to be a very specific approach to that hero's journey. Well, after that happened, this genre we're talking about became more mainstream with two movies that appeared in the late 90s, and those were The Faculty and Jawbreaker. And I gotta, like say Jawbreaker is the bigger one here because Jawbreaker really took that Heather's vibe, whole entire factor with the mean girl trope. You have these high school girls that are actually acting the way that your regular killer would be acting in a slasher film, but they're actually the ones that the audience is rooting for because they're the ones you get to see and whose character arc you get to follow through the entire movie. Jawbreaker was an interesting twist on this genre because the kill was 100% accidental. They did not mean to do it. And they used the old trope of, we can't call the cops because no one will believe us. How heartless Rose McGowan's character was is really what set this movie apart, though. Because she was cold-hearted, almost completely remorseless, 
where the other girls you could tell it was weighing on them more, eventually causing one of them to break off from the group because she just couldn't handle it anymore. That kind of bravado and ego is eventually how they bring her down. And that's the thing with the confession with the killing, it was equal parts believable and unbelievable. Because the other girls in the school are like, yeah, of course they did it, they're mean girls. And we get that right up front at the beginning. The girl that died was nice, but the other ones were kind of bitches. But it's unbelievable because it's hidden behind this very posh, refined, powder pink veneer. And it's meant to be a diversion tactic of, oh my god, I couldn't have done it. Look at all this glitter. This is exactly, I think Jawbreaker was pretty much generally where Mean Girls became a horror film. I think Jawbreaker was like a really defining point in horror movie history. <laughs> yeah, Jawbreaker, not a horror movie. We know that. It's a dark comedy with this very polished veneer that gives it this mainstream appeal. But it reaches into that horror place with how they deal with the death. Yeah, um, as ridiculous as that sounds, Jawbreaker is so much more important than a lot of people give it credit for. It's the same thing as Buffy and Heathers. These are not straight up horror movies, but they pull from old horror elements and old horror tropes to build their story. And these are the building blocks that are going to take us into the modern day with this genre where we are looking at more straight up horror movies. Pretty much took Heathers, took Buffy, and took Mean Girls, which was one of the biggest comedy of the time and I would act, like really say Jawbreakers defined the genre because everything that comes after Jawbreakers on this list is sort of um, most comparable to Jawbreakers but everything before that you could argue still. Heathers was like the first step. Jawbreaker took those horror elements set by Heathers and started exaggerating them more and more. It's funny, it's exactly 10 years later, no, 11 years later after Heathers came out, that Jawbreakers came out. Yeah, and this is where we get Ginger Snaps, where it becomes a bit darker. In the 90s, we had dark comedies with a few horror elements. When we get to Ginger Snaps, we're moving more into horror with some dark comedy elements. B and Ginger were already outcasts, so they didn't need to pull a Mean Girls and push people away from them to hide their crime because no one was really paying attention to him in that way to begin with. And it's weird because after Ginger Snaps, which was a trilogy, it took really five years until the genre kept going again. And the whole entire thing started off with Jennifer's body. And Jennifer's body, you already have Amanda Seyfried and fucking Megan Fox in one movie which for the time was amazing. Those were like the two hottest chicks in the world <laughs> back in the day. And um, what I really loved about Jennifer's body and what made this genre pretty much develop was that it was at the same time incredibly funny and at the same time incredibly dark. You had the trope of the ridiculous band singing through the trees and... <laughs> If, if anybody remembers that stupid song. And you had um, the trope of the mean girl because um, Megan Fox was like the most popular badass girl in this film. Like her character was the most coolest and lovable cheerleader. And I think that was the first movie that took these contrasts and placed them at their extremes. You have, like, the extreme of total popularity, and you have the extreme of total darkness of someone who had already died and was trying to, like, live this high school life as a dead person. That's pretty much what made Jennifer's body work so well. It took the whole, took all those films we talked about earlier and put them in these totally opposite extreme levels. Jennifer's body suffered from the same problem that the Slumber Party Massacre trilogy did, where it was meant to be kind of a horror comedy, but where it was marketed as and taken more as a straight up horror film, when in reality it was taking the extreme horror and the extreme comedy and kind of blending them together to get this weird middle ground. And uh, 
that pretty much made way for fun films like Sorority Row that back in the 90s would have probably been an outstanding movie that people would have noticed, but Sorority Row 10 years later was just... This was like, Sorority Row was maybe the first film in this genre that wasn't really noticed by the mainstream at all because people had seen that already. And then you got The Loved Ones. The Loved Ones is when we're starting to move into pure horror. Not only that, more extreme horror, which rarely has a female villain acting solo. Um, I'm going to step outside of the box shortly and just like have to mention Sean Burns, that guy. He made two movies, The Loved Ones and The Devil's Candy. All of those have sort of revolutionized the horror genre. The Devil's Candy, you would have that very dark rock and roll inspired color palette with a lot of blacks and dark reds. But then you'd get a burst of color, which is exactly how the music went as well. I think he is somebody who like, I think without all the films we had in the 90s and the early 2000s, Somebody like Sean Burns wouldn't have even happened. Jennifer's body honestly felt like Amy Heckerling, who did Clueless and Loser, sat down and tried to write a horror movie. I know exactly what you're saying. Yeah, totally, totally. It's sort of weird that this genre we're talking about that never really got a name created new directors and new films. It's so weird because this genre has been existing for exactly 30 years and it hasn't really been defined yet. (laughs) And that's the origin of this video. These movies are more than just female-driven horror. These movies have a completely different visual aesthetic, a different writing style. They look and feel just completely different than any kind of just straight-up female-driven horror movie. I mean, it already started with I spit on your grave back in the day. Even though a lot of people would say, oh my god, I spit on your grave is so fucking sexist or some shit like that. I spit on your grave pretty much put feminism into horror. Rape in film works when it's used well. Because in real life, unfortunately, that is a very transformative experience due to how traumatic it is. Do you know that I spit on your grave originally had the name Day of the Woman? Mm Mm-hmm. And I think, like, already going into a story about a girl getting raped and taking revenge and calling that Day of the Woman is something so feminist and so empowering to women. I really think that that was something that a lot of people totally ignored. That was like something very important for final girls and for women in horror, generally. I Spit on Your Grave was inspired by true events. He found a girl who had been assaulted, brought her to the police, and saw how terrible the reaction was because coming forward, while not easy now, it was much harder in the 70s. I did not know that. That's insane. (laughs) And this was his reaction of wondering, had she just taken the law out of it and handled things herself, what would that look like? And we saw a very similar plot line to this in Sympathy for Lady Vengeance. I have seen Lady Vengeance, of course. Yeah, definitely. Spoiler warning, because we're about ready to blow a massive plot point in Sympathy for Lady Vengeance. What happens is when she is able to prove this man was killing people's children, she goes, okay, we can hand him over to the cops. It's probably going to take forever. And there's a chance he might still get off. Or we handle this ourselves and make sure no one else is hurt by him again. After um, we we sort of got off rail. (laughs) A little film called Detention. And this is the first time... uh, Detention wasn't really noticed by the mainstream almost at all. But Detention is pretty much an amazing film that explores comedy, surrealism, horror and drama and coming of age films. Pretty much all in one. And the thing about Detention, it's like eight genres, at least, in one single film. But what, where Detention is relevant in our, genre, in our genre discussion is the fact that our protagonist and our hero in this film is a girl who is a total loser. She's the one who has to battle through popularity. She doesn't stand up 
against the popular girls. She just like tries to survive. And by surviving, she sort of becomes a hero because the world around her is just so weird and so cruel that you're just like happy that she made it. And seriously, you have time travel in this. You have teenage drama in this. You have comedy in this. You have pretty much everything in this little movie. Did you see it? I haven't, but it sounds like Lola from The Loved Ones. She just went nuts and started pouring liquid into guys' heads. I know, but like, uh, the tension is like Lola, but with a lot, much more lighthearted, uh, tries to, really tries to explore as much genres as it can. And it succeeds in a lot of aspects. And um, I think this one's the most underrated one, because... This one actually, like, really pretty much summed up everything we've been talking about so far. And after detention, something weird happens in 2013. The Carrie remake comes out. And the thing about the Carrie remake is that pretty much fits into this genre because new Carrie has to battle with all these popular girls and has to, like, really fight high school popularity and her role in her time while as the old school Carrie just pretty much has to fight being bullied and her weird mother but new school Carrie ends up in this world of popularity it's like somebody took this genre and put Carrie into it and I think that is what made the 2013 version of Carrie a lot more modern than the old school version. Bullying was prevalent in both the original and the remake of Carrie. The thing is, it was different when we were growing up. A lot of us were able to escape by just going home. Now, social media makes the bullying and harassment kids get 24-7. And that's really what the remake addressed. I think I, like, literally survived not having that happen to me. I graduated from high school in the year 2000. I was 06, so... I was just so fucking lucky. (laughs) Since all these films are so focused on popularities, social media had a very big influence on them. Exactly, and we see that a lot in All Cheerleaders Must Die, which came out the same year. People record their lives so much it made sense that that's where the footage of the cheerleader dying in the beginning came from. And I think that is also the first time, like, hashtags were put into a movie ever. Not 100%, but you might be right on that. Hashtag horror didn't come out until much later. Well, after all cheerleaders must die, the whole entire thing went into TV with Scream Queens. And a lot of people, like, really don't understand how big Scream Queens was and what it meant to this genre. It was the most mainstream way of taking this genre to. Like, you had a cast featuring Emma Roberts, old school Scream Queen Jamie Lee Curtis, and it took everything we talked about and shoved it straight into your face. And the comedy was so extreme that it almost seemed like a cartoon and the deaths were so gruesome that they seemed like something we would have seen in late 70s snuff movies almost. That's why I loved Scream Queens. Scream Queens was something so big and if this show would have had a bit more room and a bit more time to breathe, people would have really understood how important this show was because This was the first thing in media, generally, that really said fuck off to all the tropes and took extreme horror and extreme comedy and smashed it into one ridiculous mess. But maybe that's the thing. Scream Queens was a mess, but a proud mess, and it wanted to be a mess. It lasted two seasons, and those were wonderful seasons, but pretty much helped define this genre. And then 2017 came along and we got Tragedy Girls. It's a hark back to everything we've been saying. This is a direct line to Heathers. They're going to get popular off killing people and they're going to capitalize on that and build this image. And it makes the path 
for this film a lot easier because social media is now a fully developed thing. Social media defines popularity today. And these two protagonists in this movie, they wouldn't be able to exist without social media. Tragedy Girls as a concept wouldn't work without social media. Exactly. It was a precursor in hashtag horror. Moving them into senior girls shows that line between childhood and adulthood. And we're getting a generation now that totally grew up with social media, unlike us, who didn't really have it most of our developmental years. Yeah. And I'm glad you're mentioning hashtag horror. I forgot to place this on this list. And hashtag horror is the, maybe the only movie in this list, in this genre that we've been talking about, that takes preteen girls into this world of death, popularity, and keeps holding on the tropes. The only thing that's missing in hashtag horror is the humor. There's pretty much none of it in there. All that humor comes from how weird and overly dramatic preteen girls can be. That's true. But hashtag horror takes it to this level where you can't really even find it funny because you know exactly that these girls are going to like that. It's pretty much too real to be funny. We've seen that one too many times in the real world. Not necessarily preteens killing someone for likes, but harassment for likes. Tragedy Girls does the same, where they claim they aren't exploiting this, but they're riding that line between that and real journalism, and they do cross the line and bounce back and forth multiple times. It's so funny. This list ends where we started. Here we have Heathers 2018. And Heathers 2018 is much different than Heathers 1988. Heathers 2018 ain't really... The unpopular girl and the unpopular boy get together to kill the popular girls. No, this is the regular boy and regular girl get together to fight the SJWs, the social justice warriors. Where this genre is actually developing into something new. It's actually, for the first time, creating its own political message. Which I think is something that is being very underlooked by people who are criticizing the show at the moment. But here we are again. It started with Heather, and now we're back in Heather's. Dear After Dark Analysis, what are we going to call this genre? We were kind of back and forth on that. Let me pull up the Twitter conversation real quick. We had a couple of solid ideas. I would love to call this bubblegum horror. It's the glitter, pink, female, innocent girls being... The cold-blooded murderers. Same with female kid killers. There's no boys will be boys, so that inherently means more manipulation to hide their crimes. They're really overcompensating by going super feminine and going, see? I didn't do it. Look at all this pink. At the same time, you can't really just like write it off as bubblegum. Because like, these girls pretend that they're bubblegum but they are generally much more deeper and darker and angrier. Yeah, the better metaphor would probably be bubblegum with a razor blade in it. Yeah. <laughs> yep, that's pretty... Razor blade bubblegum horror, but that's too long. Yeah, yeah it's way too long. Bubble blade. <laughs> that just sounds like we made a blade out of a bubble. <laughs> yeah, totally. But the thing is, I love this genre. This genre is like something that really made me laugh and made me cry and made me feel so much. And it doesn't even have a name. You talked about calling it girly horror, but there is somewhat of a bad connotation with that. Because you will have people that go, oh, I like scary things, but not too scary. And that's kind of what it sounds like. <laughs> but I think like even... Why does this genre exist for 30 years and doesn't have a name? Why do you think that? How did this happen? I mean, Eli Roth released Hostel sometime back in the 2000s, and, and Saw came out like a year before that, and it didn't take two or three years until we suddenly had the name torture porn thrown into our face. To be fair, the torture porn genre started out more with guinea pig and Ricky O's story of Ricky. They just didn't call it that until it went mainstream again. 
Because one thing that ran parallel to a lot of these films was in the early 2000s, there was a boom of essentially rewriting Taming of the Shrew for teenagers. We would get a girl with kind of a dark or outsider-ish aesthetic about her, and by some happenstance, she gets popular and gets with the popular guy, and then realizes popularities and everything. And these really were just bubblegum pop in film form. And this is where we pretty much also come to a film that maybe almost marked the beginning of this. Like, not really was the beginning of it, but made this genre be very focused upon that people pretty much um, neglect in how important it is. Mean Girls. Mean Girls invented this game. Oh, it's a total comedy, and it didn't have many darker elements, but the dichotomy we keep talking about is shown really well in Regina's outfits, especially when she's wearing like a puffy pink sweater mixed with a black leather skirt. kind of showed that very pink, very feminine, but I will defend myself if I have to. And Mean Girls really did shape the look of how a lot of these films look now. Yeah, but like... I think the closest to Mean Girls is almost in her first body when you say things like that. Well, it was done by Diablo Cody, who also did Juno, which was also in that vein of kind of anti-high school films. The overwhelming majority of any high school isn't going to be popular. Most of us don't get to take off our glasses and become pretty, or you get a makeover and everything's fine. It's still kind of working with these real world issues and realizing most of the people that are going to check these movies out aren't going to buy the whole the popular guy fell for you because of a bet. And pitching the be true to yourself philosophy is probably going to go over a lot better. I'm wondering if other mainstream things today like Riverdale or even the pop artist we know as Poppy are influenced by the films we have been talking about. A lot of people seem to be under the impression that the Riot Girl movement was this tiny little blip in punk of girls singing about feminine issues while using a mixture of masculine and feminine vocals. They'd be backed by these stereotypically punk bands, but your lead singer would be dressed very feminine. Courtney loves a really good example of this, specifically before she started really acting. She had the hair, the makeup, the dress, the shoes, the stockings, and a very stereotypically female voice, but she's being backed by Holt. When you mentioned it, I was first skeptical, but then I thought about it and I was, and I realized like after five minutes of thinking that you are completely right. Uh, Courtney Love pretty much is the riot girl. I mean, she was um, Lola from loved ones 20 years before Lola from the loved ones actually happened (laughs) you're you're probably going to get crucified for that one the reason I say Kathleen Hanna is she was the founder of a lot of the zines bikini kill Julie Ruin she set a lot of those building blocks in motion and that's why most people consider her a very integral part of this but I'm not saying that like she definitely made the staining point Hannah made the first step, but it was Courtney Love who took it to that level, who took it to prom night. I'll agree she made it mainstream, but there just seems to still be a lot of old beef between fans of Love and fans of Hannah. I'm not sure why that still exists. Courtney is a bit more girly than Hannah is, and Hannah is a bit more punk rock than Courtney is. Respect to both of these women, I love them both, but Courtney is more glitter. Hannah has more punk rock, I just gotta say it. Hannah is teeny, but she has this very commanding presence about her. This was women looking at punk and saying, this is supposed to be inclusive and I don't feel represented here. And we see this exact same philosophy with the Afropunk movement. Punk is supposed to be accepting, but it wasn't and it's still an issue today. Punk gave these issues a platform, but it wasn't without controversy. Definitely. But now imagine the punk rock genre had accepted Joan Jett as an artist, especially the Bad Reputation album. A lot of people act like this came out of nowhere, but Roseanne read Bikini Kill lyrics in her show. 
I did not know that. Unfortunately, I can't find the clip anymore, but it was a later season, I think after she had the baby. Her and Jackie were in a car. They end up picking up a female hitchhiker. She's talking about how she needs a ride to a show. They're playing in a storage unit. She ends up playing a little bit of music and leaves them with the tape. Yeah, I get we're dating ourselves. That's the decade we're in, though. She eventually opens up the liner notes and reads lyrics to I believe it's Don't Need You and is saying them in such a way that middle America can hear it. And both of them realizing, yeah, there's something more here than just noise. And this leads to a discussion about how they didn't really feel represented in music, especially rock music, when they were growing up. At one point, Roseanne even says, thank God for Janice. Jackie says something along the lines of, I also learned the truth at 17. And Roseanne yells back at her, I met Joplin, not Ian. And that's kind of part of the joke. Jackie remembered the more sappy, emotionally driven thing in Ian. But Roseanne remembered the more powerful and influential Joplin. And we did see this bleed over into the teen movies we were talking about earlier. In 10 Things I Hate About You, no one calls Cat a riot girl, but that's clearly the music she's attracted to. There's an exchange that takes place at a bar while she's at a Letters to Cleo show, where Heath Ledger's character says, well, they're no bikini killer, the raincoats, but they're all right, which were two really influential bands in the Riot Girl movement. So it was kind of the writer's way of giving a nod to that in a slightly more accessible way, since a lot of people watching that movie might not have been familiar with those bands. But that's also like the thing, like this was there before somebody called it Riot Girl. We had Sonic Youth. We had um, Velvet Underground with Nico. And we had, um, as I mentioned before, Joan Jett, all bands with very strong women um, being like the leading force of these bands. And really fighting against conformity and against conservative forms of lifestyle. If these bands would have gotten more recognition as feminist bands, maybe we would have had Riot Girl, we would have had a Riot Girl movement in the 80s already. Exactly. It was more regulated to the 90s when we saw more of these films coming out. And zines definitely helped with the cross communication. And it gave people this platform they really hadn't had before. I'm not sure if this crossed over and was a thing in Germany or the UK. Yeah, we never had a UK or a European right girl movement. That's true. Damn and, um, you, conservative Europe. Damn you. <laughs> I know some people debate whole, but Courtney Love did start in Babes in Toyland, which is undeniably right girl. I, I... You can't, you cannot say that Courtney Love is not Riot Girl. Courtney Love made Riot Girl mainstream. I'm not saying she isn't a Riot Girl. I'm saying Hole doesn't totally fit in with the bands we're talking about. I mean, Miss World. Is there anything more Riot Girl than a song like Miss World? <laughs> but the backing's so not punk rock. <laughs> the Runaways, specifically if we're looking at a song like Cherry Bomb, is absolutely a precursor to all of this. Just instead of the leather and jeans that we got with people like Joan Jett and the Runaways, these girls ditched it for dresses and ball gowns and the more stereotypically feminine look. What do you think Joan Jett thought when that happened? <laughs> she wasn't even considered as a riot girl. Rarely do movements like this come out of nowhere. When we look at people like Joan Jett, Patti Smith, the Runaways, Hell, I'd even go so far back as to 1965 with the Shangri-Las and Leader of the Pack. It doesn't need to be an all-female group to fit into the Riot Girl movement. A lot of people that know Hannah's name know her because she was friends with Kurt Cobain. She's also been very open about where she was a stripper and she made sure and pushed for it to be an empowering thing. Because the underlying issue here is equality. It's not all men are bad, all sex isn't bad. It's making sure everybody has a say in what they do and what they can do. Yeah, there was no the rebellion against men, and that somehow made this movement so pure. All right, I'd like to thank the Movie Void for not only coming on to talk with me about this, but to bring it to my attention to begin with. I know this was kind of an experimental episode. If you guys like this type of thing, I can see if we can do it more often. As always, if you like what you're seeing, please hit like, comment, subscribe. 
And the link to Movie Voyage channel will be on screen and in the description. If you don't like what you're seeing, please feel free to leave me a comment below. Thank you. Yep, Jawbreaker set the tone. Oh, shit. Reverse that.